open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. We're going to be looking at a few verses together with you and studying what God has to tell us. This is God's word. And as we begin our study, I'd like to ask you a question or I'd like you to ask yourself a question. And the question is, how tired are you? Now, it's a very important question. We're, we're going to see that. And we're going to see why it's an important question. And it is important for us that as we come to Scripture, it is not just an academic exercise, like an academic lesson that we go through and then we uh, draw some conclusions or draw some applications at the end. The whole Bible, as we approach the Bible, we approach it with a sense of neediness. So not at the end of study, but before we even begin, we begin as people who are needy, and Scripture gives us the answers, solves our problems, opens up new ways for us to live. And this is how we should approach Scripture, as needy people. In fact, a lot of people do not understand the Bible precisely because they approach the Bible without a sense of neediness. They come to Scripture as to a chemistry textbook or a math textbook as problems to be solved, something to be understood. In fact, many people, many people's faith is sort of a, it's sort of a cerebral faith. That is, it's all in their gray matter somewhere here in their brain. It's very logical. It's very, it's, uh, very rational and very, very cold, icy cold. And this is not how we are to approach our faith. This is not the faith that Jesus calls us to. This is why our study and interpretation of the Bible must never be only at the head level. Your heart must be in it. And this is why I ask the question today, how tired are you? Not in a sense, strictly speaking, of your physical tiredness, but I'm asking today, how tired are you of your life? How is your faith, that is, how has your faith in Christ delivered to you what it has promised to deliver? Or has your faith in Christ has been something that has been burdensome to you, a burden that you have been carrying and something that produces a sense of deep soul tiredness, a hard labor that you can never seem to rest from. Now, every person, every person since the fall has been hunted by this gnawing feeling that they are not enough, that they are, that they are under this displeasure of God and that God does not feel pleased with them or he is displeased with them. And because of that, life is spent in convincing ourselves and convincing other people too that we are enough, that we in fact can live a good life, that we in fact can perhaps even please and convene, convince God himself that we are enough. That is a very exhausting way to live. No amount of rest can give you this this uh, a cessation of exhaustion. No amount of sleep will give that to you. No amount of entertainment can drown that, drown that out in your life. No amount of substances will ever drown it out either. This is why, the sad, actually the sad part about this is that many Christian people who go to church every Sunday and even during the week are among some of the most tired people on this planet. Tired in terms of deep soul tiredness that they experience because of their constant effort and lack of rest. And this is not new at all. As we look at the Bible, Apostle Paul dedicated the whole letter of Galatians speaking about that and we went through that letter about a year and a half ago. And now Jesus takes on this same issue here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Let's read it together. 
Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My goal today is to disturb those of you who are comfortable and comfort those of you who are disturbed. We're going to look at three things. First, the burden that Jesus is talking about. What it, and so this, that's the first thing. The second thing, what his invitation really means and the rest that he promises through that invitation that he offers. Let's look first at the burden that Jesus is speaking about. Look with me again to verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So the question for us is, what is this burden, this, this weight, this heaviness that Jesus is uh, describing here? So let's, let's think about the context here. Jesus is speaking to the crowds. There are people around him, people who are living under the oppression of Roman government. They are not free. They are being occupied by another nation that rules them with an iron fist. There has been multiple attempts to overthrow that rule, and all of the attempts have ended in a line, a line of crosses, lining the roads with men dying from asphyxiation on them. That was the Roman rule that they were under. So there was definitely definitely this sense of oppression that these people experienced. Another thing that these people were very common, very simple people. They were not the elite people of the day that Jesus is speaking to. The elite people have rejected him. He was not part of one of them. Jesus Christ was not the one that they wanted to see and hear and follow. And another, another factor, as we look at the crowd uh, that is surrounding Jesus as he speaks these words, is that this crowd was also, there was a lot of people in this crowd that had diseases and disability. They heard of someone who could heal, and they went to get healed. So these are people with diseases and disabilities and burdened with all of that. So all of this is the context to which Jesus is speaking to. But then there is something greater, a greater burden that Jesus is addressing here. And this greater burden, we will understand more clearly as we hear Jesus speak again about the burden in Matthew chapter 23. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1. Let's look at the burden that Jesus is describing that these people are carrying the heaviness. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, he's speaking to the crowds, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on the Moses seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. So this is the burden that Jesus is primarily interested in or primarily speaking to. Not that he's ignoring all the rest of the burdens. He cares about that too very much. But this is the burden that Jesus is addressing here uh, with, with, the, uh, with the greatest emphasis. The scribes and Pharisees that Jesus is speaking about here are or were the spiritual leaders of the day. They were the spiritual leaders of people in Israel. And this is how Jesus describes them. 
there's two things, at least there's many more, but a couple of things that I wanted to draw your attention. The spiritual leaders were extremely conscious of their image. They were extremely image conscious. Look at verse five. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Skip to verse six. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So there is this extreme image consciousness. At their core, the spiritual leaders of the day, those who led the people, uh, at their core, they wanted to look good. It was more important to look spiritual for them than to be spiritual. This was the example that was given to the people. It is more important to look spiritual than to be spiritual. For those leaders, it was more important to look happy and have a, to look like they have an abundant life than to truly have an abundant life. To look like they had strong marriages than to really have a strong marriages. Uh, to have a strong marriage. It was a, about a main, maintaining a false image. And that was what was taught or portrayed. So this is why Jesus says, they see on Moses' seat, so whatever they preach, whatever, whatever they teach about the law, that is, whatever, whatever scripture they teach, listen to it, but do not follow their lifestyle. Do not follow their interpretation of scripture. And the second thing that Jesus is pointing here, the spiritual leaders were trying to control people's behavior by external religious performances. Look at verse four. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. Now this was a very common image for people there. Uh, they didn't have four by four trucks that we have and, or semi-trucks to carry loads they had animals to do that sometimes slaves but most often the animals and and it was a very common Im image for a donkey to be loaded so much with weight to transport that it would literally become disappear because it was it was it was covered by all of the load that was placed and baggage that was placed on it and obviously, an animal would not be very excited to carry all of that, so a thin rod was used to strike the animal on whatever parts were still visible so that the animal would carry that load and continue carrying that weight. Jesus uses this analogy to describe the spiritual leaders of the day who were piling up more laws and rules and all of that for the purpose of trying to find their sense of acceptance by God. It was, it was, their, it was people's sense of failure, sense of guilt, sense of shame that the Pharisees and the leaders were exploiting. They took that and they said, well, you got to try harder. You got to do more. You got to be better than that. And, the, and there was no hope for people who failed. No hope for people who did not live up to that start, uh, standard. This, this is the context to which, uh, to which Jesus is speaking to. The only hope in that system was that your good would outweigh the bad. But it's interesting, but at the end of the day, it was still the weight that they carried. It was a weight, a heavy burden. And this is to, it is to these people that Jesus says this invitation, come to me, all of you who are laboring and who are heavy laden, who are, who are buried by this burden. Jesus, Jesus is speaking to the religious people here. And as I said earlier, Christian people are sometimes among the most burdened people that we encounter. People who are tired, deep tired because of the same type of life. People who are hunted by this sense that God is still not pleased with them. That they gotta try harder. That they must spend 
They must spend their life convincing themselves, convincing others and God himself that they are enough and they've done enough. All the while, while stumbling under the weight of that effort. And no one's excused or no one's free from that danger. There is, there's no one who, who is spiritual enough not to be tempted by this type of lifestyle. I... Um, I remember a couple decades ago, I was listening to this preacher who was truly a celebrity preacher for me. And I, uh, I listened to him and I really, really liked him and the way he explained the Bible like no one else. And then one day, I got this amazing privilege to spend a little bit of time with him. I, I thought that, you know, my level of spirituality is a, was about to just go through the roof because I was, I was obviously going to spend some time with this guy. But when I met this person, I met a cold and condescending person, a person in whose presence you felt that something was wrong with you, that, you, that you're not enough, that, that you are, you're, you're really nothing. And it really puzzled me. It puzzled me for a while. After that meeting, for years, I kept thinking about this strange experience of this incongruity between this proclamation and this seeming knowledge of Christ and this life that lacked humility. And I, until I realized that very often, even pastors and preachers, they use even the biblical preaching itself as a way to bolster their sense of worth, to bolster their sense that they are enough, they've done enough. And that, as they live that way, as they preach that way, that drives them to a greater, greater view of themselves. And this is why in their presence, you feel so small. So something that, that something is wrong with you. You know, Paul Tripp wrote a couple of books on this subject, uh, one called Dangerous Calling and another one called Lead. In both books, he's exploring that very, very fact of spiritual leaders who are using their gifts, using, using things that God calls holy in order to bring themselves to the state of worthiness. I'm not telling you this in order for you to doubt your pastors. No, I'm telling you that to, to show you that no one is excused from this. This type of thinking and approach to life is a very common thing. It sneaks into our life. This is a type of life where you live carrying the burden of trying to be enough. And you either rise to this sense of accomplishment and haughtiness because you've done enough or you are plunged into a sense of shame because you have not done enough. And it seems to be that this life alternates between one or the other. It is a very exhausting way to live no matter how much you do, you still feel that God is displeased with you. And even if you are not a Christian here today, as you're listening to me, you still go through the same cycle. It's just that you are not using quite the same measurements for yourself as a Christian person. In fact, in our culture, it's an interesting thing that was observed, that in our culture, there's very little things that are left for you to be ashamed of. Just there's just a very small margin now of things that you can do and be publicly ashamed of. And yet at the very same time, people's, people report their sense of shame to, to a very large extent. That is, there's so many people who struggle with the sense of overwhelming shame. People who do not ascribe to biblical view of morality, who have completely freed themselves from all of that, they cannot overcome their sense of shame. The question is, why? Well, the answer that Scripture gives is it started in the Garden of Eden. It started even before Adam and Eve partook of the fruit. 
Adam and Eve, as they listen to the serpent, the serpent says to them, you will not surely die. And it says in Genesis 3, 4, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent says, God has lied to you. You've been duped. And now as Adam and Eve consider and believe, a sense of shame comes over them that they have been lied to, duped by the person they have trusted. And as they eat the fruit and they disobey God, they realize that it was a deception of the devil. Judgment of God comes, and now the sense of shame completely takes over their life to the degree that they cannot even look at themselves. They have to cover themselves. They are full of shame. And ever since then, we carry that. And this is why Jesus, as Jesus is speaking to the people who have been exploited, that sense of shame has been exploited to do more, to, to try to please God and to finally have a sense that they are enough, Jesus gives them this invitation, come to me and I will give you rest. So let's look at this invitation that Jesus gives. This is the second point, the invitation. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. But what does it mean to come? Obviously, we cannot literally walk to Jesus now as people were able to walk to him and follow him. We need to look at what Jesus means by accepting this invitation, coming to him. How does it look like? We need to look at the, the context of this chapter. This chapter is set in the context of rejection of Christ. There are cities that Jesus has just pronounced a woe onto. A woe is some judgment that is coming. There is a imminent danger and judgment that will fall upon for these people who have rejected Christ. Look with me to just uh, uh, earlier in this chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 20. It says this, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So these are the cities that did not receive Jesus. And they did not repent as Jesus came to bring them the good news. Now skip uh, down to verse 23. Jesus says, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Jesus says some very shocking things here. Capernaum was uh, Jesus' hometown. This is a place where Jesus did many miracles. It was a town that was very large or a larger town. It was next to the sea, so they, they enjoyed the privilege of, of commerce there. And they were, uh, economically, this was a very, very well-situated city. It is a city where people, as Jesus calls them, were exalted. Yet, Jesus says, they will be brought low. And he speaks in a very shocking way. He's, he compares, or he's, uh, yeah, he's comparing religious people in this city, those who trusted Torah and followed the spiritual leaders of the day, he compares them to people of Sodom and says, oh, the people of Sodom, it will be more bearable for the Sodomites than for you guys. And this was a very shocking thing to hear from people of that day. How could it be morally religious, outwardly morally religious people received such a terrible comparison and have been found to be below people of Sodom? And Sodom was the symbol of the greatest sinfulness and deterioration, moral deterioration. Jesus says in verse 24, but I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. 
It was a total impossibility for people of that day. It would be like Jesus saying today, it would be more tolerable for the, tolerable for the Sodomites in the day of judgment than for an outwardly moral person who regularly attends church today carrying his Bible, but only outwardly moral. So why didn't people in Capernaum receive Christ? Why didn't they believe the message of Christ? Well, it was because, as Jesus says, they were exalted. They tried to follow the rules and regulations to please God, and they found themselves to be enough. And so they couldn't take Jesus seriously. His talk of repentance, that was not for them. And Jesus says, you will be brought low. So the first thing that must happen for you to experience the offer of Christ and to keep experiencing it is your sense of needing Christ, your sense of need of cleansing of, by Christ, your desire to repent. This is the context in which Christ says, come to me, and this is what it means to accept him. Otherwise, Jesus says, woe, to you this is this is a very common thing where this city capernaum was was had a face of of moral goodness that that somehow they were good and yet on the inside god looks at them at the empty shell and says woe to you there's a child's or children's story that that illustrates this well. There's uh, the, the Wizard of Oz. You ever read that children's story where, where Dorothy and her friends, they, at the end of the story, they come to the Wizard of Oz, this great head. It's a scary, intimidating head. There is thunder and, and there is this, there's this fire and the head speaks and frightens them. And then at the same time, Dorothy's dog runs to this side room and pulls a curtain, and they see this little man who is standing there, and he's operating these levers, and he makes all these sounds, and he makes all this thunder, and they realize that this scary head, the Wizard of Oz, was this little man in the corner who was trying to make this grandiose sense of wisdom and power. This is what Jesus is saying. One day when the judgment comes, Jesus, God will, will just take the curtain away and expose the emptiness inside of many people who have tried to look spiritual but have not been truly spiritual, who, has, who have tried to look moral but have not been truly loving Christ from the heart. And to these people, Jesus gives a warning and at the same time gives an invitation. There's one other thing as we under, uh, try to understand what it means when Jesus says, come to me. And that is in verse 25. Look with me to verse 25. It says this, at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and reveal them to the little children. Jesus here says, this offer is for those who are not wise in understanding, that is, those who are not wise in understanding in their own eyes, but for the little children. God the Father reveals the Son to the little children. That is, to those who do not think of themselves as anything, they're nothing. They're not on any social kind of ladder. They are, they are really, there's nothing significant to them. There's no worth. There is no accomplishment. It is to these people that Jesus gives his offer here, to the little children. And this must be something that we continue to experience throughout our life as those who follow Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is the, the inner posture of a person who truly is a disciple of Christ. It is those who dis- experience the utter dependence on God who will experience his rest. And so what is this rest that Jesus is offering? And that is the third point, the rest that Christ is offering. Let's look again at Matthew, at Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some puzzling and some puzzling words, paradoxical words here. For, so the first question is, why is Jesus talking about a yoke here? He's talking about rest, and yet he's talking about a yoke. A yoke was a harness. So it's a, it was a harness that was placed on an animal so that an animal could, could pull a burden, a cart, or an ox pulling a cart or some other weight. Uh, a yoke was also used in time of conquer, where a conquering nation would sometimes place yokes on people who were led away into slavery. Another, uh, another symbolism of yoke that was used at the time of Christ was by the spiritual leaders. There is writings of rabbis who spoke of the yoke of the law, a yoke that you must accept and carry and therefore enter into the kingdom by carrying this yoke. Jesus offers a completely different type of yoke. In verse 30, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's easy, it's light. In fact, the word easy, the same word is often translated in the New Testament as kind, a kind yoke, something that as it's placed on you, you feel kindness of the one who has placed it on you. And that is to say the yoke or that the life that Jesus is offering is, feels so light and easy in comparison to this desperate attempt to be enough in the eyes of God that you feel this sense of kindness. There is another thing that Jesus says about himself speaking of this yoke that is, that is to be taken. Verse 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly. What does it mean that uh, Jesus is gentle and, lo- uh, and lowly? First of all, learn from me is the same root word as disciple. Jesus is saying, become my disciple. Follow me. Follow in my footsteps. Follow in my life. And as you learn from me, you will discover that your master that you have yoked yourself under, your master is gentle and lowly. This is what Jesus is getting at here. He says, as you follow me, as you follow my leadership, as you follow my, me as your master, you will find yourself in a place where your master is already pleased with you. He says, don't be afraid to follow me because I am a gentle master. I am lowly. I will not lead you in a domineering and harsh way. He is not difficult to please because he has been already pleased forever. Gentle and lowly, it says, in heart. That is, it is the essence of who he is. There is no pretension of being a kind master. There is the essence of Christ the master who is gentle and lowly in heart. He's lowly. That is, Jesus is not afraid to stoop down to serve. There were two prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of the, of the coming Messiah as someone who would come on a donkey. A donkey and not a horse. A donkey was a lower animal. That is, you sit closer to the people. 
as compared to a horse. A donkey was a slower animal. You wouldn't, he wouldn't just gallop into Jerusalem on a horse. He entered Jerusalem on a donkey, a lowly master. Instead of galloping, Jesus enters Jerusalem seated on a donkey. Instead of ascending a throne in Jerusalem, Jesus ascends a cross. Instead of taking up glory and power, Jesus lays down all his glory and all his power and experiences the full force of the Father's displeasure on him instead of us. This is what Jesus invites you into. This is the only way to experience rest for your souls. Martin Luther, commenting on this, said, it is a burden which unburdens us and a yoke which bears its bear. A burden that unburdens. So how are we to take this text and to reconcile it with all the texts that speak of Christ or following Christ as being something difficult, as being a difficult thing. For example, Jesus himself says in Matthew 7, verse 13, he says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The way is hard. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. These are the words of Jesus. How are we to reconcile the two? It is this, it is this paradox here. This is actually the paradox of the Christian life that we must hold and not try to fall on one side or the other. In order for us to understand these words, we must go on in verse 16 and hear what Jesus says uh, in chapter 16, verse 26 of Matthew. He says, explaining these words, he says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So Jesus here is comparing gaining the whole world, that is gaining the worth, all the worth that you can imagine, gaining it all, all the world, the respect of people, the riches, the honor, the accomplishment, you've got it. And at the same time, your soul is shriveling up in agony because it is lost. Jesus says, what use is that? Jesus is offering a different way. There's a type of life where in the, in the eyes of the world, you are insignificant. There is no worth to you. You, ha you have not accomplished anything. And at the same time, you have found shalom, the peace that God gives, the peace and rest that Christ gives. You have given yourself to the service of a master who is gentle and lowly, that is what makes it so easy. It is, it is not a life, it is not a life um, that is easy in the outwardly, or in, uh, in the outward dimension. Uh, it, is, it is a life that is often difficult, and yet at the same time, Following Christ liberates you and gives you rest. One person defined it this way. Following Jesus is the hardest thing you will ever love. Following Christ is the hardest thing you will ever love. What an interesting combination of words. Even though this is the hardest thing you will ever f do, the hardest thing, the hardest life you can ever choose, it is a life that you love because of the one who loved you. The followers of Christ are not immune to the world's pain and suffering and trouble. 
And yet at the same time, the followers of Christ have found this peace, this freedom, this lightness, this acceptance from Christ forever. I have, I've was, remember, I, I was talking to a woman who, who has just gone through a sudden tragedy in her life. And as she was sitting across the table, she's speaking about it to me, and then she says, but yet Christ has given me such a peace, such a comfort to my soul. I'm surprised at the supernaturalness of it all, the peace that Christ gives me. This is the life of the followers of Christ, those who have found rest in him. Apostle Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This is what we feel and this is what we experience as we accept the yoke of Christ, the burden that unburdens, the discipleship that Christ calls us to, the master who says I am gentle, lowly, you are safe with me. You can follow me. As we finish, consider Christ who came to give you rest. If you're tired of life today, there is someone who gives rest, true rest to your soul. I was talking to a young man recently. He was describing to me his the, his way of coming to Christ. He came to Christ in, a, in, a, in this church. He was not a believer. He's not from a Christian family. And this church is, was all he knew. And this church was very particular about things that they were either right or wrong. Men's haircuts were sometimes too short, and therefore they were wrong and condemned. There were a lot of services during the week, and if he would miss a service, he would be... I received a phone call asking why he wasn't attending a service. Uh, he, there were, people would be regularly asked about their tithing, the 10% that they are giving or not giving. Ministries were required. You, you had to be part of a ministry. And the more ministries, the better. And as this man was living through that, he said, I became more and more anxious, asking myself the question, am I doing enough? Have I done enough? I become more and more anxious my family who was they were unbelievers they said we will never go to church i mean look what it's done to you all joy is drained out of you this is a sad reality of many christians who live their life trying to be enough before god they still are trying to serve a master who will never be pleased with them. Their view of Christ, their view of God, their view of what Christ has already done is very shallow. Christ has said it is finished and it is enough. You will never be able to do enough because you are not enough you will never rest. It will be like a person who goes for a nap during the day, only to wake up more tired and more groggy and less rested. It is not a life of discipleship Jesus calls you to. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Easy, that is kind. Jesus is a kind master, a gentle master he is not hard to please he's already pleased you don't need to do enough everything has been already done for you you are secure in his life now is being a, a disciple of christ a costly thing is it absolutely being a disciple of christ is a costly thing. It will cost you everything. Being a disciple of Christ will cost you your life. But it is a cost that is paid as a result 
of a rest. It comes from this rest of heart and soul that has, has discovered the love of Christ. Rest from your performance and rest in the love of Christ. And that liberates us to follow him and to give him our all. Why don't you rise and we will pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for these words. Thank you that scripture is not an academic book, but it is a book of life that speaks to both our mind and our soul. Thank you that in Christ Jesus we can be free. We can find rest as we take on this life of discipleship for him. Thank you that our master is a kind, a gentle master, a, pa a master who's already pleased, a master who has already done everything for us. And help us out of joy of that. Go and sell everything like that man in the proverb of Christ. Help us go and serve him with our outmost, with all that we have to lay everything at his feet because he has loved us so. Lord, we ask this because we know that we fall into our efforts-based life all the time. None of us are immune from that. And therefore, we ask your spirit to give us the power to look to Christ who has accomplished everything, to look to Christ who has done it all, and to find our worth and not in our efforts, but to find that we are enough because Christ is enough. And let us rejoice in that. Amen.